Some things in life are really simple, but they're very tough. I can remember just about thinking I was going to lose my mind trying to get a charcoal grill started. And, you know, I would think, I should be able to figure this out. I have a college degree, and I can't figure this out. Well, the key is, forget the charcoal grill and get a gas one. So I finally figured it out. But I can remember times thinking, my family's hungry, and I'm trying to get this thing started, and just can't get it started. I remember when we lived in Oklahoma, we had two acres there, and so if you can imagine, this time of year we had quite a few leaves to burn. And so I had them all raked up, and I was going to take care of burning them myself. I lived in the county, so I could do that. I had them all lined up, and trying to get this, these to start. And I'd try to start them, and they'd burn for a few minutes and then fizzle out. So I was thinking, I'm having flashbacks to the charcoal grill here. I can't get it started. And so finally I figured out, what's the most combustible thing that I have available to me? Gasoline, I'll try that. Well, that was a mistake. I lost my eyebrows that day. I finally got the leaves burned, but it took a while. Or things like, uh, you know, the, the harebrained idea in Oklahoma, I'm going to save money by changing the own oil in my car. Well, that works out pretty well, but tell you what, those oil filters are hard to get off sometimes. And I can remember tugging, pulling, and thinking, I think I'll just take this in and have somebody else do it. Simple, but, but tough. This weekend, we were at the cross-country uh, state meet, got back last night. So we stayed in a, in a motel on Friday night, and there was no one in the swimming pool, so I thought, I'm, I'm going to challenge myself to some swimming laps. I got in the pool. I think I'm going to go down and back ten times. So I went back and forth the first time. Yes, I did it. It was great. Second time, yeah, I did it. Third time, I think I'll go for five rather than ten. <laughs> Simple whenever you think about it, but pretty tough. But a lot of things in life are that way, aren't they? They're kind of simple to say. We can give them a lot of lip service. But when it comes right down to doing those things, it can be pretty tough. I came up with this list. How about disciplining children? It can be kind of tough. You think, I'm the boss. I'll tell you what to do. You will obey me. It doesn't work that way. It can be kind of tough. Or what about fasting as a spiritual discipline? Well, that's kind of easy, isn't it? Don't eat for a few days and pray. But it's tough to go for a few days not eating and pray. So it's simple, but it's pretty tough. Or what about getting up early? Now, I don't have as much trouble with that as I used to, but it can be tough. I'm going to get up early and work out. Easy to say, but kind of tough to do. Being polite to people who you don't like, that's pretty tough. Simple to say, well, I'm just going to be nice, but pretty tough whenever we get around to trying to practice it. Tidying up our favorite workspace. There's an indictment on my garage. Household chores. How about obeying our parents, kids? That can be kind of tough, too. Easy, simple, but tougher to do. Or exercising. Man. How many wonderful exercise equipment pieces can you buy in yard sales, unused, all over town? Because I'm going to buy them and exercise. And then I bought them for $49.95 and I sold them for 49 cents at the yard sale, unused. Simple, but tough. Turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. I would like for us to look at three things that we find in this section of scripture. I'm using the uh, New International Version, the older one from the 80s, 1980s, today. Titus chapter 2, beginning verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness 
and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he <laughs> saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. We have here then a list. There's more than three, but I'm going to use three from this. Three things that are simple but tough. And the first one is saying no. Saying no. Simple, but tough. Man, I kind of tend to be a yes guy. I say yes to too many things and I'm overscheduled. Now that may be bad for my health and for my, my own personal um, you know, health as far as mentally. But there's a lot more at stake when you think about saying no to eternal decisions. Things that I need to say no to that are from the world, that I have trouble, that are tough saying no to. Saying no is simple, but it's really tough. So we're going to, in this lesson, kind of just march down through this passage of Scripture and let the Bible explain what it means itself rather than me trying to give explanations. First, Grace, the teacher. Grace, the teacher. As Paul writes here to Titus, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us. Grace is what teaches us to say no. And we're going to see also in this passage, it teaches us to say yes. What is grace? I like this explanation a lot. It's one also that was reflected um, by Marlon Conley when I was the youth minister in Nashville. Grace is God doing good for us that we do not deserve. In the Bible, grace and mercy are like two heads of the same coin. Mercy is God withholding judgment or evil that I deserve. And grace is God giving me blessings or good that I do not deserve. So how do you explain the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is getting less than I deserve, less punishment. Grace is getting more blessings than I deserve. Grace. God's grace is a great motivator. It is a great teacher. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. And Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's difficult to understand such a selfless love because it's usually not the way I love. I want to. I aspire to it. But the reality is to love someone as much as God loves me And to offer that kind of grace to me that when I didn't and don't deserve the salvation that I receive and the love that I receive, that I still receive it. It's mind-boggling. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was, that was in me. Paul was so overwhelmed by the grace that had been given to him to have been snatched out of persecuting Christians to become a Christian. He's so overwhelmed by that great amount of grace and love given to him that he worked even harder, not to earn something, but because he had been given something. It's grace. So grace is the great teacher here. It's the great motivator. And as Paul writes here to Titus, he says, grace brings salvation. And this grace has taught me some things. It's taught me two things. It's taught me to say no, and it's taught me to say yes. No to ungodliness and worldly passions, and yes to self-control, upright, and godly lives. Now be careful this is simple, but it's tough. And we can rattle through all these words and say, yeah, that's exactly right. But when it gets right down to trying to practice these things, no to ungodliness, that's hard in our culture. No to worldly passions, that's tough living in a human body that has passions. Yes to self-control, we can give self-control lip service, but it's pretty tough to be self-controlled. Living upright and godly lives, simple, but tough. Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Isn't that something? What was good for that present age is certainly good for our present age. Instructing us to deny godliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. The New American Standard Bible says it uses the word deny rather than to say no. But the meaning is the same. Sometimes the best answer is for us to just say no. Being a Christian is simple but tough. We are to deny all those things which will distract us and which seek to stop us from our attention to God and his word. word. Worldly desires are easy to find and available on every high street. Worldly passions, simple to satisfy. Let's look at these three words a little bit more of, um, in detail. The New American Standard Bible uses the word sensibly. We have these words self-controlled, upright, and godly. We are to say yes to these things. These are the things we are to do. These simple things, but yet tough. Self-controlled, which means literally with a sound mind. Or upright, literally, properly, and justly. And godly, which literally has to do with being reverent and devout in my faith walk. These are the things then that are easy to say, simple, but tough to do. But grace teaches us. And because we have received such an overwhelming approval by God through his grace, we are motivated, we're taught. I'm just going to say no. I love God so much, I've got to say no. God's been so good to me, he's forgiven me so much. I'm going to say yes to these things, of being self-controlled and upright and godly. So that's number one. Saying no. Number two. Waiting. Waiting. Huh. I don't like to wait. Man, you can see some irritated people waiting in the checkout line at a grocery store or at one of the supermarkets. Or waiting through the traffic lights in Harrison. And you just about get up to here with your irritation until you drive in Little Rock and you can't, get wait, ba- you can't wait to get back and wait in line at the light in Harrison. <laughs> because just when you think it's just so bad here and you have to wait two and a half minutes at a light, then you wait 15 and a half minutes somewhere else and you realize two and a half is not terrible. 
but we're also fast-paced in our lives. And so I've written here, we're really not very good at waiting. And usually when I say we in statements like this, I say we because it means me, okay? It's difficult to wait patiently in an instant world because everything comes so quickly. We were riding back on the, on the bus, on the school bus uh, yesterday, and I can't use my phone because I was driving the bus. So like, look this up on your phone. So I've got a phone, so I was looking it up, asking questions. You know, there's a super bright moon going on right now. We want to know details about that, and everybody's looking up stuff. Instant information. Just ask Google. Ask Siri. Instant answers. You can find out anything you want to. You don't have to drive up to the library and get out the card catalog and look it up and get a book and look at the back of the book. Try to find the answer. Instant. Right there at your fingertips. Same for food. Take it out of the freezer, tear open the package, stick it in the microwave. One minute later, you're eating. Instant. Some things in life that are good, you have to wait for. We're waiting for Christ to come. It's hard to be patient. It's difficult to wait in an instant world. So here's the list that Paul gives us. Waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of Christ, the Redeemer. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify to himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Last week's lesson was about persistence. It was about what sets apart the people, the men and women from Hebrews 11, from others who've gone on. And it is that they were faithful when they died. They were persistent. They were believing. They were faithful at the moment of death. They had made it to the end. And that's really what's hard because, as I pointed out last week, sometimes I'm pretty good and sometimes I'm not very good. But the difference is in those who are faithful and persevere is that no matter whether I'm good or whether I'm bad, I'm going to push through and I'm going to keep going and I'm not going to give up. And that's what makes a faithful person. Also, Paul says to exhort and reprove while waiting. Speaking these things, I, to exhort and reprove with all authority and let, let no one disregard you. While you're waiting, while you're keeping your eyes upon eternity, help each other. Exhort, reprove, help each other. Yes, it is a personal quest, but yes, it is a joint responsibility. And we have an obligation to each other. If someone checks up on you and says, I missed you at church, don't be irritated. Thank them. Because when they're checking up on you, they're obeying what God wants them to do. And that is to exhort and to reprove. Not in a look down your nose attitude, but a, I love you. And I care about you. Attitude. Although our duty is to live in the God-given present, our eyes do need to be fixed on the future when we shall, at the end of our days, be together with Christ in the certain future that is the kingdom of heaven. Waiting. And now number three, the third one. Doing good. Doing good. And when I saw this and it was in our Bible reading recently, I thought this would be a good one for today. Because doing good is something that we Christians are commanded to put into our lives despite the political climate. Look at verse 1 here in Titus 3. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. We may think that our political climate is in bad shape, but think about the audience that's receiving these letters. 
a very hostile environment towards Christianity. But yet even in the midst of that hostility, Paul says Christian people have the responsibility to be good people, even when the political climate is evil. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready to do whatever is good. Good is a simple and undervalued word. It's a very simple word. I usually try to avoid using the word good in my everyday language because it's very nondescriptive. It's just kind of plain. How do you feel? Good. You know, I'd rather say something that's a little more meaningful and descriptive than just that one word. What do you think about this work I did? Good. You know, kind of undervalues it a little bit. You want somebody to say it's excellent, it's wonderful, looks super, not good. But when the Bible uses the word good, it is a word that is used to describe God. It's a great word. It's simple, but it's tough. It should be our desire to be good. And this whole section has good mentioned time and time again. Regardless of what's going on in the world around you, you should be a person who is eager to do what is good. Good works, good attitude, good in your character, to be a good person. And so if someone says of you, she's really a good person, that's not undervaluing you. That's to say you have a claim to the things that God says are good. After all, isn't this what we want to hear? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. If Jesus sees fit to call faithful people good, then it's something that I aspire to become. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus went around doing good. Listen. Whether you got your way in the election or not, there's one thing that's clear. We have an obligation to be good. We do what is right. We do, we do those things that are good. That is our call. We are to do good then also, Paul goes on to explain, despite our past. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy and being hated and hating one another. Well, here's a list. A lot of people could use this list to say, I have a reason I don't have to be good. Look at my past. If you had a past like my past, you wouldn't strive to be good. You'd strive to get even. At one time, we were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved. We lived in malice and envy and hated and hating one another. That sounds like a pretty miserable place to be. But that's the past. Despite our past, we are good people. We choose to live and to do and to be good. Paul goes on to explain that doing good is easier and easier to accomplish when we are focused on God's goodness. Focused on God's goodness. He's so good, I want to be good because I desire to be like him. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're going to be good despite our past, but we're going to be good because God is good and how much good, how much good he has done to me. And so I'll remain focused upon his goodness. And when I realize how good he is and how good he's been to me, then I'll aspire to goodness myself. 
In Psalm 100, verse 5, from the King James Version, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. God is good. And finally, in doing good, Paul ends by saying that this quest is an excellent and profitable ambition. It's worthwhile. It's excellent. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Can you not see here that time and time again Paul says, do what is good. Focus upon what is good. God is good. And being good is excellent and it is profitable for everyone. So it should be our aspiration as we leave here today that we are going to go out and we are simply just going to be good people. To do what is good, to say what is good, to have an attitude that is good, and to live a life that is good in a wicked world. Despite our past, despite whether we get our way in an election, if everything doesn't turn out exactly the way we thought it would or should in our lives, past, present, or maybe even the future, it, there's one thing that is certain and constant. It is I am going to be eager to do what is good. But beware. It's simple, but it's tough. So here's the list. Saying no, simple, but tough. Waiting, simple, but tough. Doing good despite political climate, our past, focused on God's goodness, simple, but good. And so we'll close with this scripture. Listen carefully. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. If these words have touched you today, I invite you to come now as we stand and sing this song.